Good evening, Ray of Hope and friends. I'm delighted to, you, to welcome you to this discussion entitled, I Can't Breathe, Being Black in America. Our discussion tonight will focus on the social and spiritual implications of COVID-19 pandemic, during which you all know a disproportionate number of black and brown people contracted the disease and many died. We'll also discuss the pandemic of the continued murders of unarmed black persons in America. But before we go on any further, you need to know that this is the fifth anniversary of Mother Emmanuel. Nine persons lost their lives at the hands of a young white man. Could we take a moment of silence as we remember them? Amen. Thank you. I'm delighted to have as my guests three brilliant colleagues and friends who all have their finger on the pulse of what is happening in our country and are actively engaged in the fight. They are the Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes III, the senior pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, where he has served for 35 years. Dr. Haynes is a prophetic preacher, passionate leader, social activist, eloquent orator, and an educator engaged in the struggle and fight against racial injustice. Dr. Haynes is also committed to economic justice and empowerment in underserved communities and touching and transforming the lives of the disenfranchised. Reverend Tracy Blackman, is the Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ and the Senior Pastor of Christ the King United Church of Christ in Florissant, Missouri, where she was installed as the first woman and 18th pastor in its 162 year history. As pastor, Reverend Blackman leads Christ the King to an extended, expanded understanding of church as a sacred launching pad of community engagement and change. And Reverend Courtney Clayton Jenkins serves as the visionary senior pastor and teacher of South Euclid United Church of Christ, where she made history by becoming the first woman first African-American and the youngest pastor ever to be called to lead this congregation at the age of 27. Five months before she was installed, the church was completely destroyed by fire, but under her leadership, the church purchased a 10 acre campus and completed a renovation and brand new construction project for 8.15 million. Thank you all so much for joining me for this discussion. I will ask you a couple of questions and then we have some that have been submitted by members of the congregation. And then if we have time, we'll open it up for others to share in the comments section. I'm also grateful to our social justice ministry under the leadership of Deirdre Pierce and Reverend Kenny Rice for offering this opportunity. Well, as you know, this is the 23rd day of protest since the murder of George Floyd. And while we are still reeling from the murders of Ahmaud Avery and Breonna Taylor and Floyd, another black man, Rashad Brooks, was killed in Atlanta by police among others, and two men in Southern California have been found hanging on trees. In addition to that, though most of our states have opened up, new cases are spiking in 19 states. I want to begin with a personal question, one that allows you to share your heart. It's been said that pastors are really essential frontline workers, and that's true. 
and you've been on the battlefield for a long time, but in an intense way. So the question I want to ask you to open up with tonight is, how are you feeling? What are you feeling given the two dimensional impact of the COVID tragedy and the recent police and citizen violence against African Americans? Anyone can begin. I mean, I'll just say that I'm tired. I am um, hurt, drained, um, and yet I'm determined and hopeful. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that, um, Dr. Haynes, because I've been wrestling with naming those feelings all week. Um, I am weary in a place that sleep won't cure. Right. I'm weary in a place that rest can't touch. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual weariness, and yet I have hope. Mm. Um, I'm perplexed, to be honest, if we're going to have a conversation here. I have racked my brain trying to figure out what was different about George Floyd. Mm. That's good. That wasn't present with Emmett Till. That right. wasn't present with Michael Brown. <laughs> that wasn't present with Sandra Bland. That wasn't present with Tamir Rice or Eric Garner. Or, I mean, the list goes on and on. Trayvon Martin. Oscar Grant, um, it's not even that we haven't seen state-sanctioned violence live. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm also perplexed. I'm grateful because whatever's waking people up, I'm just grateful they waking up. Right. Um, and I still have some moments of joy. I laughed when uh, the Black Lives Matter statement today was Aunt Jemima got retired from the pancake box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uncle, Uncle Ben got retired from the rice. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it takes. <laughs> the Lando Lakes lady, too, you know. Right. <laughs> All of them, you know. All of them. White folks done woke up. What's going on? <laughs> Oh. I have never received so many notes and emails and calls. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So what it's interesting. is different? What is different, do you think? I want to push that a little more and then. You know, there certainly was a level of callousness. Yeah, that's what I think. To this, mm -hmm. to this murder. Right. Um, you know, he didn't even bother to take his hand out of his pocket. Right. Come on. <laughs> Um, the man was restrained. There was a level of callousness, like, and I know everybody's taping me, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. There's that. And I also think that because people were sheltered at home, I'm talking about white people, black people, we always go here, right? Um, but I think because people have been sheltered at home, and they watch that for right. eight minutes and 46 seconds and if i can be completely honest i think that what flashed before their eyes was this fascist that we've allowed to become president is not gonna stop here right. <laughs> and that really could be my child or me who loses their breath next but i don't know i think it's that i think that they realize we're in trouble yeah. In ways that we haven't realized before. I'll stop because we haven't heard Courtney. I would say um, I am overwhelmed. Um, I'm disappointed. Um, I feel like I am actively and consistently traumatized mm -hmm. over and over and over again. But the one thing I was thinking about is, if I'm really honest, 
I am sick of listening and I am sick of talking. And I'm like, when does change? When does reform? When, you know, I've been doing a lot of consulting with a lot of other organizations in this season. And, you know, everybody wants to talk. And I'm sick of talking. We've been talking for decades, centuries. I mean, we just, we've been talking. And at what point, um, you know, do we, do we realize it? I also think that in part, what makes this a little bit different, if I can just kind of add to what Reverend Blackman shared, is I do think that we have not just a baby boomer generation of white folks who have witnessed this, but I think we have a millennial group of white folks who have witnessed this. Because if you look at who's out, that's not that's non-black out protesting, yeah. um, it's not baby boomers. Right. Uh, there was a protest here in Cleveland a couple of weeks ago with people on skateboards and rollerblades. You know, that was not yeah. us, right? <laughs> protesting. <laughs> For Black Lives Matter on the west side of Cleveland. It could have been us. Not on no skateboards and roller skates. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we at least would have been on regular skates, you know, without the skate ring. Um, and so, um, and you're seeing these videos um, of young people, you know, young white people fighting their parents on these perspectives and challenging that. Um, and so I think that that plays a role, that there is a younger white resistance. We've had so many protests here in Cleveland in predominantly white neighborhoods orchestrated by young white people. Um, and I'm wondering about that generational divide um, and maybe what role that's playing in, in, this, in this rising up. Um, and, and again, it goes back to, you know, Dr. Blackman's question. I don't know what makes this different than all the other ones, um, but, but I think that that's playing a role. The last thing I would say is in addition to just sick and tired of listening, I am postured for change um, and really asking the question, how can I, how can the people I lead move the needle on this? We got to move the needle on um, and figure out how we get that done. And you've led beautifully into a question asked by Donovan Cohen. He said, this movement we are currently experiencing, do we truly believe it will bring about the change that we are requesting? And what do those changes look like? So Doc, let me say this, first of all, and I don't know why I didn't do this earlier. Uh, I'm really honored that you are doing this. I mean, you are Cynthia Hale. And so uh, thank you for your ministry, for your leadership, for your consciousness. And then uh, I'm like crazy honored. This is going to be my favorite Zoom out of all the Zooms since March because I'm Zoomed out. Uh, but to be on with Courtney and Tracy and you, I mean, it's like crazy. I'm putting this on my resume uh, because I have such admiration for all of you. Thank you. And uh, I just really appreciate this honor. And I really appreciate this question because my response is going to be, it really depends. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we settle for the shallow symbolism that America likes to you know, play us with, then of course, I think it's gonna go back to business as usual. I think it was uh, what Jeremiah Wright says, you can't fix what you can't face. And right. my thing is, you will not heal from what you ain't real about and refuse to deal with. And my concern is, is this country really ready to deal with the ugliness in her history, in her rootage that continues to bear the, the nasty fruitage? Because again, it ain't like this is the first time that yeah. we've witnessed this kind of you know, brutality and inhumanity. It ain't the first time. And, and the whole piece with COVID even disproportionately killing black people were tested least, dying most, not because, you know, Mr. Surgeon General, because we 
need to stop drinking out al uh, drinking alcohol and smoking tobacco but because right. of the pre-existing condition of blackness that yeah. makes 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 make that racism is what a mm -hmm. A, I mean, I mean, racism is sadly and sinfully and shamefully not just a pre-existing condition, uh, but it's a public health issue. That's what I've been looking for. So racism is a public right. health issue. Being black is a pre-existing condition. It's been this way forever. And yet I'm hopeful that we have what, what William Barber is calling a third reconstruction. Uh, and this third reconstruction will only take place if we are real about the fact that a America ain't all she's been lying to herself and her citizens about being. The whole greatness of America never was. It's great on paper, but in right. terms of the hypocrisy of the practice of democracy, America ain't about it. And if I was in other company, I'd have used some other language. Okay, we got, I'd say, we got, America ain't we ish. Okay, America ain't, ain't ish. That, that, that's the lingo we can use <laughs> uh, on social media. So, yeah. so America has this ugly history that we're going to have to finally get real about so that Black people have been criminalized, otherized, demonized, and weaponized. Yeah. And, and, and I have to say this, and I'm not even you know, trying to say it, but just because my sisters, but I, I keep going back to Malcolm X right now. Black women, most neglected, most disrespected, most unprotected, forever. So, 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 so America has to deal with how America has dissed black women mm -hmm. and how America has, has, has in a real sense created a climate where it's okay to diss black women. There's some ugliness in this history. And I'm saying this in Texas because this state where I am, Dr. Hale, is the state that decided in its textbooks to, de to, to declare that slavery was what? Uh, well, really indentured servitude. And so right. instead of dealing with the fact that in the history of humanity, there has never been a more evil expression of enslavement. Slavery ain't new, you know, we, mm -hmm. let's be real. But no other country has been more evil in her inhumane expression of slavery than the United States of America. This country right. ain't ish when it comes to the whole concept of democracy. So as far as I'm concerned, if we ain't real about that, we're not gonna heal from where we are right now. And then I guess the second piece that I'm through right here is that if America is going to really use this as a time of transformation, I'll put it like this, change cost. Yeah. Right. There's a price you have to pay if you really want change to take place. Martin Luther King Jr. said it so well. He said, integrating lunch counters, that didn't cost this country anything. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking seriously about making this country one of liberty and justice for all, you have to do something. It, it's going to cost you, you know, reparations. It's going to cost you investing right. in communities that you continue to neglect. It's going to cost you, I love it, defunding the police and reimagining what public safety is supposed to look like by investing in communities. If you don't do that, we going back to business as usual, uh, and this won't be a third reconstruction. Did you hear that Netflix mm -hmm. pledged a hundred and twenty million dollars? It cost, yeah. yeah, to historically black colleges and universities. That's where it begins. Yeah, For, but yeah. Here, here's my thing, though. I mean, all these things that they are doing are, are wonderful, um, but we earned them. <laughs> well, oh, well, we earned them. They they're not doing it. That's right. Uh, it's not charity. Mm -hmm. It is. We earned everything that they are doing and more. Right. Historically, black colleges should not just get a hundred million dollars. They should be endowed at the level of Georgetown That's and right. Harvard, That's and right. Princeton, yeah. because we built those. Right. Yeah. Thank you for so, free. That's the piece for me. Um, I also want to tap into what Dr. Haynes said. I, I kind of go into a trance when Dr. Haynes is talking, so I got to <laughs> Don't we all? Don't that's we all? Why he's on the call. Right. He no, must. I, I, okay, Look, that's, that's why he's the brother on the call. Stop, stop, stop. You got it. Thing, I, in some ways, and 
and I hope you all can hear me that I feel like this is our moment. Yeah. This is what we do better than any other race there is. We multitask. Oh, girl. And we endure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're in the midst of a perfect storm. And we must be careful that we don't allow our, um, our focus to become too narrow. The, the, the protest and the pushing in the streets are getting us some advances right now. I mean, I've never seen police kneeling in the street. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, not unless they want somebody's neck. I mean, right. I haven't seen that, right? Um, after all that Colin Kaepernick went through, for now the commissioner, what's his name? Goddell or Goddell? Goddell, yeah. Goddell. 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 To say that he was wrong, though that doesn't fix what he did, mm -hmm. but he's wrong and he should have never come out. He didn't understand the kneeling thing. For military to be breaking with the president, the commander chief, in chief, that's unprecedented. Right, right. So there, there are some things that are happening because people are in the street and not just people here, but people around the globe. We're getting letters from Switzerland and the yeah. UK and London. I just did an article for London about what's happening here. There are people in the streets everywhere, right. but that's only one front. Right. We're in the middle of a census. Come on. Say that, Trace. And only 51% of people have completed the census. Exactly. I, I just want to be real clear about this. Yeah. Because what happens with this census will impact us for 10 years. That's right. Right. So we've got to be pushing that. We've got to be counted there. That's right. And then at the same time, we're in the midst of an election cycle. Right. Yeah that is critical to the future of our children and our children's children. If we don't turn this thing in this election cycle, then we will have a Supreme Court that is majorly picked by a self-admitted white nationalist president. Yeah. He has already appointed over 100 federal judgeships that are lifetime appointments. 95 EPA regulations have all been already been rolled back. He will desecrate health care, yes. desecrate all of our safety nets. We have an educational system that's being run by someone who can't spell education. <laughs> I'm, I'm just being serious. No, no, absolutely. 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 And we have someone who grew up in public housing, Come but on. in public housing, in skin that looks like mine. Yes. And doesn't but. have a clue. We cannot do this for more years. Mm -mm. So, so no I could jump in here because one of my challenges when we talk about the change is I'm concerned about many of the things you shared because I'm concerned about how much change is going to take place if we do not change, not just who's in the White House, but who is in all of these other seats of political. Yes, exactly. And lead us to go back to what uh, Dr. Haynes said, which is you can't discount people and then expect them to fill out a form to be counted. We have been consistently discounted by this nation and we need to fill out the census. But the work at the end of the day is because black folk are going out and saying, you need to be counted. But folks say, why should I be counted in a nation that has never counted me? But then you right. put that with the disenfranchisement that's taking place with these current election practices. Yeah. The right. fact that we're talking about mail-in elections makes several assumptions. Number one, that people have a printer, that people have access to a stamp, that people have access to an envelope. You are asking people to mail in and you are assuming that they have access to these things. During the last election, we allowed people in our congregation to fill out a form. We printed their ballots, took them, to, drove them to their homes in an open envelope, 
with a stamp and said, you got to sign it. You got to send it in. You got to put the stamp on there because the assumption is made that everybody has access to a post office that is safe where they can purchase stamps. The assumptions that are made are steeped in white privilege. Yes. Come on. Because the access is to a particular group does not mean that the access is to all. So I am concerned. And in fact, my team's meeting tomorrow night about how we up voter turnout. And I need to say how we, um, how we inform voters. So many times we simply push through who's always been through. We don't do the research on the judges. We yeah. want to affect the cradle to prison pipeline. You change the judges. You, yeah, we right. are the only entity in Cleveland who hosts a judges forum. It is not hosted by a political group. It is not hosted by um, the, the office of, of judges. We are the only entity and we happen to be a church where we pull people together and we say to them, hey, you need to know who these judges are. And then we bring in the attorneys from the congregation to ask the questions to say, the way you answer that is not consistent with what I see in your courtroom. That's problematic. So you're promising what you can't deliver on. And there just comes a point where we have to realize this is an uphill battle. It is what Reverend Tracy said. We can rise from it, but we have to have a strategy to overcome it. But what you're talking about, Reverend Courtney, is critical because it is a look forward, but it's also a look back. Yes. Right. The church, the black church, always had to do that. <laughs> always. We moved yeah. away from it. Yeah. As we got advanced and we got technology and thank God for all of those advances, right? But yeah. these, these critical uh, touch points that you're talking about, that's going to be the role of the church. Yes. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. Agreed. That's right. The challenge becomes that we've had conferences about preaching and not a whole lot of, we do have some, a whole lot of conferences about community organizing. We've had conferences about church growth. We don't have conferences about community growth. Better right. do we repent as the church that we have ill-equipped a generation to be Come able on. to do this work? Yeah. Preach that. Preach yeah. that. Yeah. Can you say right yeah. Go ahead. No, Please. I was just going to say, uh, Henry Mitchell in Black Church Beginnings, he says that when the Black church was born during enslavement, every Black preacher made it their business to transform mm -hmm. their pulpit into a platform for abolition. They connected the social, economic, political plight of the people with the spiritual responsibility of the church. So what Dr. Exactly. Courtney Clayton Jenkins is throwing down and what Dr. Tracy Blackman is saying to us is that we have gotten away from Come why on. we were birthed to begin with. And so right. maybe we need to get, I don't know, let me, uh, okay. Maybe we need That's to go back to what birthed us Come because on. somehow we got caught up in a hermeneutic in an ecclesiology, in a theology that was alien to the needs of our people because we were so busy, as James Baldwin was say, would say, trying to associate success with whiteness. My Lord. Even in the church, the whiter we could become in our church expression, the more effective we thought we could be. And so we, we even defined what? The success of the church by what white folk were doing. Right. Instead of what we did in the past, and that was by what? Are you a, 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 a part of the Underground Railroad? Or are you conducting people to freedom? Are you making an impact? And so, so I think we've got to go back and grab that because if we don't, here's the deal. The young folk in the streets, they ain't thinking about a church that does not have a theology for the streets right. that does not have and recognize our responsibility. And, 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 and let me tell you something, Tracy Blackman, that's a bad Negro right there. Tracy Blackman and I, we were on a, a conference call or another Zoom call and Tracy challenged us. She said, you know what? Uh, it's time for us to get out in them streets. Even if the language offends our sanctimonious ears and yes. let's also have the humility to not feel we have to be out front because maybe it's time for us to push to the front and support 
those young people who've been in the streets since yeah. Ferguson, since uh, Trayvon Martin. They, they've been in the streets while the black church has been growing. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And this, this is what I wanted to just simply interject. I want you to keep the discussion going, but we also have to do the next step, which is to guard against voter suppression because what happened yes. in Georgia the other day- That was ridiculous. Ridiculous. See, we have a polling station at the Ray of Hope Christian Church. They were there until 12 midnight. My Lord. That is ridiculous. That's sick. That is ridiculous. That I, was call, I was on a call earlier today with uh, Leah Daughtry, who is the CEO of um, the DNC the last couple of times. And mm -hmm. she was talking about this idea, um, and you all are the ones that we should be talking to about it, about how do we mobilize the collars mm. for voter suppression. We're gonna have to be at the polling booths. Right. Our people are gonna have to see the collar right. <laughs> at the polling booth. Come on. We're gonna have to be there. Say that, Trace. Encouraging people, giving hope, saying you can do this, mm -hmm. right? Because right. everybody is not gonna wait till midnight. No. <laughs> That's and right. we see every vote, I'm just being honest. We need real. every real. vote that we can get. We have to be out there in college encouraging people, don't you give up. Yeah. That's well, where the Freedom Center has a program entitled Clergy Collars and Lawyers or Lawyers right. and Clergy Collars. So there is a program. Yes, and yes. I tried to get in that group, Dr. Hale. They told me I was not an elder yet. I'm a young one. <laughs> I'm, I'm 57 years old. So that I might be part of what's wrong with the church right now. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you in. We'll get you in. We'll get you you're in. an elder too, Dr. Hayes. I'm an elder. I'm an elder. <laughs> I can't even Just believe it. Beer, don't you? I'm a young one. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Skinner Williams said, You are young and you have to wait your turn. <laughs> <laughs> My turn. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> Anybody, any more on that subject? Because I want to switch a little bit. So, give okay, but I, I, I think that's so important because we have a double barrel we've got to deal with. We've got to deal with not just voter suppression in the states, but the fact that you know, COVID-45 is allowing Russia to hack the election. So, right. so that combination, I mean, it can really set the stage for him to just walk right on through. So we really have to get on it soon. I mean, not tomorrow, today, yeah. <laughs> tonight. And so we also need to be mindful. Said also, not just the judges, but we gotta flip the Senate. Oh no, all of it. Desperately. And it's all about the education. Of, of those because let's be clear the republicans have a strategy they got lawyers they got a strategy they're already looking for the loopholes now and so we have to be uh we have to do what it takes to well, what do does it take how do we reclaim who we are who we've been historically, because that's what, I mean, we've done all of that through the years, as you all have said, how do we reclaim it? How do we get our colleagues to claim it? That's a great that's question. A real question right there. I, I think it's interesting. I was leading my staff today in a conversation on um, discipleship. And one of the things I was saying is that um, we have spent the last, you all can, know it better than I have, however many years preaching this independent gospel, mm. that, that what we've lost is a community gospel. What Come we've on. lost is community accountability. Come it's on. always about what you're going to get. You're Come next. On. You're the best. prosperity gospel. Right. Absolutely. The prosperity well, gospel, but also, but also our American culture does not feed partnership. It feeds right. a theology of me, myself, and I. So Say if that. I make it out, if I do, we celebrate the one, and we rarely celebrate the community. And so part of what we found out of the slave church is it's the community. Part of what the civil rights movement is, is that it's got to be community. So part of this is how do we equip people who are, and I need to say this, so much of the black church is 
presently caught up in the preaching. I think we can start by informing how we preach community, how we preach social justice, how we preach activism, and then let that lead us into, and I want to say this, we have people in our congregations who are better equipped and skilled to do this work. So with my church, I got a bad group of young people who are phenomenally committed, as Pastor Tracy said, in these streets. You know what I say to them? You tell me where I need to go. You right. tell me where you set the agenda for me because you know where the impact needs to happen. So, but, but we're used to a reverse ecclesiology. The pastor sets the direction. The pastor sets the vision. But the people have sometimes a better sense of the pulse than we do. So I think it starts with, our, with, with reworking our white anti-black theology. So Come on. much of what I came <laughs> shared about us thinking that white is the success line, that white is better. And I need to say this respectfully, that mega church is Come it. On. That Come ain't on. it. We no. need to be effective in making followers right. of Jesus Christ. And this 21st century American pansy fandom of Jesus ain't gonna get us there. Come on now. Come on. I, I want to... <laughs> Add to that a, a conversation before I was grounded. I was um, I was meeting with the Presbyterian Church in London, and they were trying this new concept out that has stuck with me. Um, they were talking about so I, I serve a, a white denomination, and that matters in this conversation. I mean, uh, Courtney is in the same denomination with me. It matters because um, the concepts of God are not always the same. I'll just say that. Um, so Boom. in, in, in this particular conversation, uh, the conversation was what it has always been for quite a while is the decline of the church. The church is dying. The church is, you know, and, and I was raised in a tradition that says the devil is a lie. The church ain't never going to die. You know, right. y'all might die, but the church is not going to die. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but there was a, a unique thing about this. They were beginning to say, what if we stopped criticizing ourselves or measuring ourselves by how many people come in the church? Come on. What if we redefined what success is in the church? Come on. What if we stopped counting so heavily the number of people gathered and the impact and transition to the impact of people scattered? Right. What if we sanctified, baptized, cheered, and supported ministries that are outside of the pulpit the way we do people who say they're called to preach or they're called to pastor. When you're called to preach or called to pastor, the church gets all excited. They laying hands on you, praying on you, pushing some money in your palm, asking you about the next level. And then when you graduate and you get, uh, uh, take off my AKA jacket. <laughs> when you get to the next level, um, then we have this big celebration, right? But the, the reality is there aren't a whole lot of Freddie Haynes and Cynthia Hale and, and Courtney Jenkins. There aren't a lot of them. The majority of people are seeing 50 to 60 people a Sunday. Yeah. Um, and they're not going to be masses of people who are seeing large crowds. So the reality is most pastors are gonna see, if you're a full-time pastor, are gonna see less people a week than the person who went to school to be a school teacher mm -hmm. yeah. or the person who's a bus driver. So I'm getting to what Courtney was saying about discipleship, right? Yeah. If, we, if we groomed people to understand that wherever they are, that is their calling. Yeah. Right and we celebrate their calling and we equip them to make an impact wherever they are, then you multiply the impact to determine the, the effectiveness of ministry versus the number of people sitting in the pews. Um, and I've been thinking about that concept because we have to have a radical transformation That's it. about how we look at church. Thank right. you, thank you, thank you. I, and, and, I'm sorry. 
but uh, Courtney said something. I'm, I'm really blessed. I'm in this PhD program, and so I've got to take Greek. Thank God I have a great Greek tutor, Dr. Raquel Letsom. <laughs> Raquel Letsom, Courtney, you're going to love this. Raquel is doing this piece, and we're walking through First John, and she said, and she's making me say, oh, in the translation, y'all, like I'm from Texas. She says, mm -hmm. y'all. So I'm saying, so are you trying to insult me because I'm from Texas saying, y'all, I'm country? She said, no. She said, she said, what we've done in American capitalism is individualize the gospel. Come on. The gospel never was intended to be individualized. Even when yeah, they yeah, read yeah. those early epistles and letters, they spoke in what? Second person plural you, right. y'all. And so what we've done, we've allowed American capitalism to focus on our personal piety at the expense of social responsibility. And until we get delivered from that American capitalistic approach to what our hermeneutic, as well as our theology, the sad reality is we are missing out. So, 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 so in the name of Raquel, let's, um, let's start preaching to y'all and not just you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, I love that. Oh, she killed me. I'm telling I'm, you. I'm taking, her, I'm taking her online Greek class in just a few weeks. Trace, you're going to oh, love okay. it. It's, it's going to wipe you out. Wait, and, and wait till she gets to this piece on the whole transgender piece. She says, so she said in the Greek, what are you going to do with Galatians 3, 28? In Christ, neither male nor female. Uh -huh. And she's unpacking that, the whole transgender piece and the uh -huh. church's allergic reaction to that. Just get ready to get wiped out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. So my I'm folks sorry, I'm want sorry. to know. No, you're you're great. My folks want to know a couple of other things. They keep asking me, what specifically can we do, boots on the ground, mm -hmm. to keep the fire of the movement, to sustain the the fire that's happening now that. It's winning some changes. How do we maintain that? What do we do? That's what lay people, I heard Courtney say, you know, let them tell us, but my folks are asking me, please tell us, what is it that we can be doing? We have everybody's to center, not out there marching. No, but we have to center the voices of the young people who are out there. We have right. to center the voices yeah. of the people who are most in pain. Uh -huh. Okay. And and that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be in the streets. I'm okay. not that person. If if you're not called to the streets, you're gonna be in the way. <laughs> well <laughs> that's just the bottom line. If that's not your call, you gotta know yourself. To that own self be true. If you're not called to the streets, you're gonna be in the way. Because when when the confrontation starts, you're gonna be the one out there waving your hand, baby, baby, don't do that, don't do that. We don't need that. <laughs> if that's not your calling, don't be in the streets. There are multiple front lines in a movement. Say that. Right. There are multiple front lines. Some people are called to fund movements. That's it. Put that's money it. in the hands of the people who are in the streets calling the shots. And there are multiple ways to do that. We can, we can share some of those at a different time. You can do that. In Ferguson, I had this woman in my church who's a member of my church. She was a 75-year-old white woman. Who, her name was Sandy. May her memory be a blessing. Um, and she joined our church because it was UCC. Um, she was the only white member in my church. And she didn't seem to know it. So we had a good time. <laughs> Uh, and when I started going to the streets, um, maybe about October, we always do a close, uh, well, we haven't in a while, but we always did a coat drive and we give away 100 free coats. It was time for the coat drive. I came to church. Sandy said she wanted to make an announcement. Announcement time, she comes out of the pew and she's carrying one of those um, grocery carts. Like if you walk to the grocery store, those wire things that you can take your groceries back in. And all I can see is plastic and colored yarn. This 75 year old woman said to me, I'm so proud when I see you out in the street. 
And if I was younger, I'd be in the street with you. But I can't do that anymore. She said, so I remember that when I was in the nursing home, my roommate taught me how to crochet. And I went and dusted those books out and I bought some yarn. And she said, our coat drive is coming up. And I've crocheted a hundred hats and scarves wow. to go with those coats. So she had put them in little Ziploc bags and written a handwritten note saying, Christ the King loves you. Mm. She said, Pastor, you didn't know this, but I used to be a math teacher. And I calculated, I counted every stitch. And I calculated mm. that I've marched five miles with my oh. hands. I share that story because we do a disservice to our communities when we act like the only place you can be is out in the street. Right. We need some people who have influence in levels that the street is not going to be open to. That's right. We need them using those connections to do that. We need people working in the legislative arena. There is something for everyone to do, but do it by censoring the voices and the, the, the leadership of those who are suffering the most. Come on. And that's what we have to do as churches. Yeah. We have to open the doors of our church as refuge if the protest is happening in your neighborhood. We have to open the doors of our church as strategy space right. for young people to know it's safe for them to come in here and recoup, regroup go over their plan again. And the more we do that, the more they welcome us in. That's right. Um, you just got to do it. it. Oh, she said it. I mean, she it's said it. and I, I think it's, a, but it, but it, I guess one of the big things that, that I've always been big on, but I've been trying to kind of trying to teach my congregation in this season is the present call. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to cultivate, and this goes back to discipleship, the discernment of what is my present call. Mm -hmm. And when we empower people to have the confidence to move on their present call, um, that is a powerful model because it is what she said. You know, I've been telling people in this season, I mean, part of my position in this season is to find the fishes and loaves to fund these movements. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I've been putting my emphasis and my effort. I, I march from time to time, but I'm sensitive to where I need to be. So if we can, and I know, but this is just the season I'm in. If we yeah. go back to discipleship, we can teach people that our present calls are not to compete, but are to complete. If people were completing one another with the present call, we could move the needle. But so often we're saying who's woke and who ain't woke and who's out and who ain't out. And so we're missing the opportunity to all be, it's hands and feet, right? They, we say don't, don't throw away any part of the body. So we're not throwing folks away. Then we're open to their present gifting, their present calling and whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'll and I just add to that that it's real important as we hear the voices and the vision of the young people who are in the streets, that when we get to translate that, that we are true to what they are basically saying and calling yeah. for. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've been doing this a long time in Dallas now, so, so I, I've been in all these meetings, you know, since this thing has, you know, jumped off. And right. the thing that I'm doing, you know, more and more is saying, okay, so, why don't you have at this table, you know, so-and-so who's in the street, so-and-so who's been doing this. And, you know, and then I'll go get them, bring them to the table. And they are quick to say, all right, Dr. Haynes, thank you. Now I'm going to say this. No, you say this because they listen to you. And so it's a real beautiful thing we have going on here in Dallas where, where I'm trying to make sure the young folk are at the table and then right. the young folk will quickly say to me, now this is what you got to say because they ain't going to hear us on this. But mm -hmm. if they hear you saying it, they're going to back up off of us. And so it's been a real interesting dynamic. But we have to not only hear their voices, but if we have an opportunity at the table, we got to make sure we bring them to that table. And at the same That's time it, that we stay on message with what they give us. Yes. yes. Excellent. That's so important. 
That is so important. Okay, so given the continued police brutality, there's been much talk about and some action towards defunding police, barring chokeholds and knock warrants. Uh, no, no, no knock warrants. The president has also signed a limited executive order for police reform. What else needs to be done? I want to suggest that um, our police remain, um, in general, undertrained. Um, so I, I found this today so interesting. It said Norway, they're required three years of training to become police officers. Between mm -hmm. 2002, 2016, four fatalities. Finland, three-year degree is required to become a police officer. Seven people were killed by the police between 2000 and 2018. Germany, two years of training to become a police officer. 267 people have died by police shooting in 1990. U.S., you need a high school diploma and approximately 21 weeks of training. And in 2019, 1,004 people were killed alone. So part of this is that... Wow. Um, when you when you lower the educational expectation, then you also keep the horizon very narrow right. because you've not gone into larger institutions that teach you how to expand your brain, expand your thinking power, expand your living with people, living in community. One of the young ladies here held up that it there takes more hours to become a cosmetologist in Cleveland than to become a police officer. So we care more about the people who color our hair than we do about people who are walking with guns. And so I want to say that one of the things I think we do need federal reform, because part of what I think ha is happening here is that uh, the police remain committed to the state and to the community. So there's no higher level of accountability. But the other piece, again, for me, is I think we have to raise the training that is required here because we're basically putting kids in positions. And what happens is they grow up in that culture without an ability to think beyond that culture. So that's one, one, one thing I think we can do. I, I agree with that. I would add to that, that I think, you know, when you become a police officer, you have psychological testing, yeah. but you never visit that psychological testing again. Mm. I think that there should be intervals where police right. have to have psychological testing. Um, I'm actually in favor of defunding the police. Me <laughs> so too. let me, uh, um, and let me say what I'll I mean by that. that. I think that different people have different interpretations of that. Yeah. Um, defund the police is shocking and joking, um, but really what they're talking about is reinvesting in community. Mm -hmm. right? Thank you. So it's a lot of our urban areas, the majority of the budget goes mm -hmm. to policing mm -hmm. versus the social services that are needed, our education, our school systems, that would prevent the need for this militarization. We don't have that because the majority of the money is going to policing. Uh, and that's what they're doing, or policing. One of the, the starkest examples for me in this moment was when uh, the protests were getting out of hand, uh, not typically because of protesters actually, but because of infiltrators. And Thank Chicago you. put the map on the TV of this area they were going to protect. They protected what is called the Gold Coast area in Chicago, down by Michigan Avenue and around the lake. And on the map, you could see that they had, dri had drawn a red boundary around that area. The right. National Guard was coming in to protect that area. Police were super enforced in that area. And they, they restricted it that you could not go in unless you could prove you owned a business or you could prove you lived there or you were an essential worker, i.e. Uh, a maid. Uh, essential worker in this area, right? But the language about it was that they were protecting the perimeter so that they could guard the people inside. And I'm looking at this huge map of Chicago and this little bitty plot of wealth that is being protected. And I know that the children that live in that area, they don't have the same worries that my children have when they go outside or when they get in the car. The police right. are actually there to protect them 
The yeah. police have their backs to that area facing mm -hmm. the violent ones that they have to keep out. But when they come in our community, they're not coming in to protect our communities. No. They're coming in to police our That's communities. Right. That's so right. This whole notion of defunding the police, I, I like it because it's catchy and it gets everybody's attention. Thank but what you. What we're really talking about is reinvesting in our communities, yeah. reinvesting in the services necessary for people not to go into survival mode. So right. that's one thing that I need, I think needs to happen. If I could have my way, I would take off the protections, the barriers that prevent police from suffering the same prosecution that anybody else suffers if they commit murder. Right. <laughs> Not just police, prosecutors who make up evidence my Lord. should not get immunity Thank they you. are putting people in jail who don't belong there. Yeah. The whole system, I, I wish I could talk like the people, like I wish I could talk. Right, like in the streets, huh? You know the what I'm saying? The whole system is guilty as hell. The yeah. whole system is, oh. is guilty. And so I'm in favor of defunding police. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just share this to talk about the brilliance of young people, and this has been translated around the country. When we talk about defunding the police in Dallas, we're saying number one, DPD will not be the first responder to mental health calls. Mm. Duh, yeah, you know I mean? You're yeah. not equipped to yeah. go to a mental health situation unless of course there is a firearm involved. City yeah. and county officials shall increase investment in alternatives to police response. We're asking them to do stuff they do not have the mentality, let alone the equipment to deal with, as Courtney pointed out, in terms of the lack of training. Number three, we're number one in Dallas in deportation of immigrants, highest number of any US, US city. And of course, these deportations have impacted black immigrants from Haiti and African nations uh, disproportionately. Who do they send to do that? The police. And that's whack. The city of Dallas and Dallas police will adopt specific policies restricting the use of deadly force. Officers shall not shoot their firearms, one, if a suspect is unarmed, duh, if a suspect is running away or attempting to withdraw, duh, if a suspect is driving away or sitting in a parked car, duh, if a suspect is not armed with a firearm, like if they're holding a knife, screwdriver, Etc. Number five, DPD shall remove from armed patrol any officer involved in a use of deadly force incident until all investigations are completed. I mean, right. what's wrong with that? And then DPD in conjunction with the district attorney's office shall review all fatal police shootings from 2000 to 2018 because, again, that stuff has never been dealt with. We shall fire or furlough all officers whose testimony for whatever reason is not credible enough to be used in a prosecutor's court. You have police officers who have made what they call a Brady list. The Brady list says if you have something in your character whereby if you testify in a court of law and they say, no, we got to strike their testimony because of their character issues, then what you doing being a police officer? And so, and I can go on and on. We got, we got a few more, but I know we got time, a time constraint. Courtney, here's what tripped me out. I'm looking at London. London, 90% of their police officers don't carry weapons. My Lord. Last year, they had less than 10 people killed in police-involved shootings. Mm. We ain't great in this country if we have to police mm -hmm. certain people, thank you, Tracy Blackman, while protecting others. Yeah, they right. serve and protect who they want and see as a threat who right. they don't. The people who are being protected are the wealthy, the money people, as you just said. Yeah. And that's the economics. All of this is about economics as well. It is. That's it is. another whole discussion. That's part well, two. Is it, it's nine o'clock. Does anybody have anything you want to say? 
further that you want to say? I want to respect your time and the time of the people who have come aboard to There's listen. Some wonderful things in your chat, Dr. Hale. And I know we won't get to all of them, but I'd encourage the people who are listening to check out the chat because there are some good um, recommendations in there as well. Someone brought up citizen exactly. review boards and that's important as long as they have teeth. We had a citizen review board, but they couldn't chew. They were like, mom's Mabley. You, <laughs> you need teeth. Don't let them put you on the board and not give you teeth. Right, right. Good. Well, I just so want to say thank you because it's been yeah. so awesome. Um, and I'm just, um, I hope that I, I am, as always, with, with all of these brilliant minds, and thank you again to Pastor Hale for pulling us together. Absolutely. Right. I think that, that we really have an opportunity. And what I hope is, I know that we have colleagues who are watching. Um, I hope that in the spirit of kind of my opening comments, that we will move from the listening and the talking to some form of action and, and to bridge that even with, with what uh, Pastor Tracy shared around, you know, it's, it's, there are lots of angles on this, right? Um, and, 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 that, and that we can come up with a proper list of demands, like what, I mean, everything that uh, Freddie Haynes shared is, 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 is kind of logical to how we should be. I mean, because my thing is at the end of the day, and I love that video where the guy says to the officer, you signed up for a dangerous job. And right. at some point you have to accept responsibility that this is the job you chose. You know, you didn't choose to be a baker. You chose to be a police officer. And so the, it, it, it's, it's there for us. And I hope that my, that my colleagues who are watching um, really will not just jump on the bandwagon of, oh, you know, let's keep talking about it. Let's, let's be about it because, right. yeah. because we have people who are watching and their critique is the church of the churches. We're always talking about it. We're not being about it. And that's what we ultimately want to see. Reverend Courtney, something you said, it convicted me and I, I want to say it out loud. Not only did the police sign up for a dangerous job, uh-oh. Church signed yeah. up. Come on here. Yeah. That's right. All That's right, right. He, Black. He signed up for a dangerous That's job. Right. And, and Dr. Hale so eloquently began us by talking, reminding us that this is the fifth anniversary of um, Mother <laughs> Emanuel's massacre, uh, the Emanuel Nine. Uh, but let's not forget that Mother Emanuel also was the, the church of Denmark Vesey. Come on. Yeah. A freedom fighter. And because he revolted against oppression and sought to be liberated, not only did they kill him, but they burned the church. Yeah. They burned Mother Emmanuel to the ground because Mother Emmanuel was the hub of strategizing and organizing for liberation. And I just want to leave us with the question to ponder. What does it mean that the empire does not fear the church? Right. Wow. Wow. Right. Why don't you just drop the mic, T. Yeah, Black? Right there. She did. She dropped the mic. I ain't saying nothing after that. <laughs> there is nothing else to be said. I want to thank you all. I can't thank you enough. Well, you have to host another party. That's how you thank us. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and make sure I'm there. Okay. Got to host another party. Let's talk about something else. Well, this was the easiest because I look the three y'all just took it. I said, <laughs> this is. I mean, you all are so brilliant, so amazing, and so kind. I just thank God every day for your friendship. And whatever I can do for you, don't hesitate to let me know. You need to know, audience, that this will be on our Facebook Live page, or our website, rather. You can view and Facebook Live, and you can view it tomorrow. <laughs> It'll be there. So you can see it again. Because I know that this was a lot to take in, and there really is a lot in our chat section. So please read through that. Um, okay, so they're saying there has to be a round two. Yeah, <laughs> what are we going to do? Okay. <laughs> so I'll have another party, and I'll invite y'all to the party, okay?
Thank you, Dr. Thank Dale. You. Thank yeah, you so thank you, Doc. You're wonderful. We love you. Good thank night, you. peeps. I love y'all. Love you, love you. Love you, Renee and everybody else. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take care.